Hello, my name is Michael Benson. I'm the co-director of, sorry, co-founder of Photo London. And I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin Cummings, whose book, Telling the Story as the Photographs of the Fall, um, is our Photo London Book Club Book of the Month. Um, it's really a great pleasure to, to that you're with us, um, especially so close to Christmas. So thank you, Kevin, for taking the time. Mm -hmm. um, you've uh, you've very um, carefully told me that this is about photography and not about music. So I shan't be asking you for your in interpretation of Hex Induction Hour or your favourite Fall album or um, or anything else, unless you want me to, in which case I will. No, um, <laughs> but uh, um, I'm very happy to talk to you about the photographs in this book because, um, to be honest with you, they they reminded they they they, they have a lot of resonance for me. That uh, the, the Fall, one of my favourite bands growing up. Um, and I enjoyed I enjoyed reminding myself what they look like in the various iterations of, of, of the band. So um, your book is called Telling Stories. And there's a, you use a quote at the beginning of the book from Anne Sexton, which talks about the images being used to shore up the stories. And I think that was that's a really nice way of putting it. I mean, presumably you chose that with with precisely that intention in mind. Uh, yes. Obviously, and I think, I mean, it, it's a struggle always when you start a book. Um, you're not really sure it, how to make it more than just a collection of photographs. Yeah. And then, you know, with uh, discussing it with various people, then we get to a point where um, you start to have a bit more clarity. Oh. And, the you know the the sexton quote tied in nicely with the title um then we had to clear the we had to clear it with the sexton estate yeah and that actually took longer sorry i need to turn my email on. sorry about that um the we had to clear it with the sexton estate and that actually took longer to do than some of the photo sessions i've done with mark <laughs> And finally, uh, we got there, and I think it would have been a shame to lose it. Yeah, uh, because you know it, it does kind of help to start a book, really. And I like to with with a, with a book like this. I I always think it's really important to have a really good narrative flow, um, and almost as as in the title, tell a story right from the beginning. Um, and I think, well, hopefully, and I, it's a good reception, so hopefully we did the right thing. I'm sure you did. And each of the, I mean, it seems to me that each of the, the you've chosen a group of images to share with us during this, during this brief talk this evening. And it seems to me that each of the, each one of them tells a particular story, but it seems to tell a particular story, but I'd be interested in seeing what the actual story behind it is. And perhaps we should move now to the images if we can. Yeah, sure. Have you, there we are. Uh -huh. Okay, so this, I was interested because just before this photograph in the book, there's a ticket um, to a disco on the 18th of August, 1977. And rather, rather uh, touchingly, the admission price is 50 pence, but it's been scribbled out and 20 pence has been written on top of it. So obviously they weren't that confident about what they're up to. But I mean, this is presumably one of their very first gigs. Yeah, I think it was either the second or the third, and um, they'd been booked into a youth club. Um, and after about three songs, the guy who ran the place just said it wasn't the kind of music he was expecting, and asked them to pack up. Um, I it was the shortest. I, at first, I thought it was going to be the shortest gig I'd ever been to. Uh -huh. and then Mark, the tour manager, rang a venue in Manchester and asked if they could come and finish the show off there. It was about a mile down the road in the city centre, and uh, they said yes. So they went back. They went into town, set up all the gear in there, and finished the show. But in typical Mark fashion, he didn't start the gig right from the start again. He assumed everybody had heard those three songs. So he, <laughs> he carried on and played the rest of it. Uh, he wasn't giving every. He wasn't giving too much away for his twenty pounds. 
No, no. Well, obviously, you pay your 20 pence and you take your choice, don't you? Um, and the second image is also, is, is, so is that from the second part of the gig or is that the, that the same the same gig? Yeah, that first one's from the youth club and yeah. then the second one um, is from the ranch where they finish the show off. Ah. I think Mark Scott is rock against racism, bad gentleman. I think he has. I was going to ask you, I can't quite make it out, but I think it is a rock against racism. Yeah. yeah. And um, so then um, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about the selection you've made from the book is that um, it's the book has got a lot of these kinds of photographs, you know, rock and roll band in action photographs, but quite a lot of what have you what you've selected are, are portraits. Um, when you were making this choice, was that a deliberate um, deliberate decision to focus on the portraits that you've made? Or, or... Well, I just think there's a fair there's a fair balance through it. Um, I think uh, a portrait is hard, well, maybe it isn't. Maybe a portrait isn't harder to craft than a live shot. A good live shot like that one um, takes some doing, I think. And I used to use twenty mil lens when I was shooting in clubs, mm -hmm. so that I could get, I was probably about two to three feet away from them. Mm -hmm. So you had to put yourself right in the middle of all the action. And although I've got a feeling that's probably got flash on it because there were no lights in the club. Most gigs I'd shoot with, you know, just using available lights. Yeah. So however much you push the film, you're still only shooting at maybe, a 60th of a second or something and you've got a lot of people pushing you and so you're having to kind of um ride with that motion and get the shot either at the top or the tail off when the movement's happening yeah and the and the next uh, the next image is is a completely different i mean you know domestic bliss what's what's the story here <laughs> yeah um well mark 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 was a Man City fan, same as me. And he wasn't very interested in rock and roll photography per se. He uh -huh. thought it was all a bit formulaic. And he said, why don't we do something like the kind of pictures they have of Dennis Stewart and Colin Bell at home? And I said, well, you know, your flat in Presswich is probably not the same as Denny Stewart's leafy mansion in Cheshire. Uh -huh. um, and I'm not, and also music paper editors tended to want fairly traditional pictures. It was always very difficult getting a picture in that wasn't a rock and roll image. Uh, but we went along with it and, you know, he'd made some attempts at tidying up. He'd pushed quite a lot of stuff under the sofa. Yeah. Um, it was a tip to be fair. I mean, it was, <laughs> and there's a few weeks worth of what of pots and pans on the, on the sink. Um, and an overflowing bin. Um, but yeah, that was Mark's attempt at tidying up really. And then I thought I'd better cover myself. And we did a shot outside, uh, near, um, Presswich hospital where I think, um, uh, one of the band worked at the time. And it was only later that when I processed them that I noticed Mark was actually holding a cat in the shots. Uh -huh. We were doing them about nine or ten o'clock at night. Yeah. And did this did this uh, photograph run in anywhere? Yeah, they used it actually. Um, they used an upright version of it, portrait right. version. Uh, but I think the main shot was obviously the outdoor shot. But I've always kind of liked these. And it's the same, you know, when I photographed Joy Division, I tried to do non-rock and roll images. I mean, the picture that's most famous is the one on the bridge in the snow. Yeah. And you can't really see the band in it. Um, and I thought nobody would ever, ever use that picture, but, you know, shows what I know about photography. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next, the next um, photograph is, 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 the, is also the cover of the book. And um, I'm struck by Mark's sartorial elegance. I mean, was he a, was he a snappy? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be that snappy a dresser, but he. he... Um, well, uh, he was quite different, as you can see. And yeah. um, the thing also, he did have a very definite look. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, um, Mark Riley, 
just looks like he's wearing what he'd wear to go down the pub market, probably make a bit of an effort for the day. Um, and I thought the cobbles in the car park at, um, it was outside what became G-Max. It was then an abandoned railway station in the city centre. Oh. And I thought Mark's jump and the cobbles kind of echoed each other for the pattern. And I thought it would make a strong, supposed to be a cover shot, but I can't remember who they put on the cover instead. Um, but yeah, I think it's got enduring appeal because, yes, you know, not many, you know, not many um, rock bands dress like golfers. No, it does look a bit like a golfer, doesn't it? And no. like Paul, who's into golf, doesn't even dress like a golfer. So. <laughs> and you put it on the front, the front, the cover of the book. Was that your decision or? or yeah, no, it was mine. I felt, you know, I, I've always really liked it. Um, Mark liked it too, and he, he stole it several times for his own use for uh, some of their merchandise, and then for fifty thousand four pounds, can't be wrong. Yeah. But of course, it was just a cut out of him. The rest of the band were in the shop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, <clears throat> it's 40 years of the fall, but it's all, I mean, quite a lot of it is 40 years of Mark E. Smith, isn't it? Well, yes. Um, you know, it was very odd photographing the fall in the whenever I turn up. And obviously, I'm not living with them, I just dip in and out of their lives. Um, but every time you would, I'd go, there'd pretty much be a different lineup. And sometimes he'd be with one member of the band, sometimes he'd be all of them would turn up, sometimes just him. Oh. And it was kind of like no, and there was never any explanation as to where everybody had gone. They just disappeared. It was like going around to your friend's house and finding he's got a new family and no one would ever explain it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, 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 none like you, I only ever, and I won't even claim to have met him. I, I kind of found him in a pub when he was meant to be playing at a, a playing, a, playing a gig. And I think we nodded at each other, and that was about the sum of it. But uh, he clearly, clearly was quite comfortable there, not remotely concerned that he wasn't actually, hadn't actually turned up on stage. No, it wouldn't bother him. And he was like that photo sessions. He was generally late, yeah. or he's going to be the wrong place to meet him. And then he'd be in the pub anyway, and he'd end up having a drink, having a catch up with him, and then doing the photos the following day when he's sobered up. <laughs> so um, the next photograph is, is again, I think he's, he's wearing the, the, yeah, there he is, there with the jumper on again, um, in rehearsal. This yeah, is that's in the same rehearsal rooms where I photographed Joy Division. Yeah. Um, and I was quite, quite conscious of wanting to make it look slightly different. I photographed several bands in there, but he, you know, Buzzcock used it as well, mm -hmm. as well as a couple of uh, bands who people probably never heard of now, but um, it kind of, it was the only, pretty much the only place in the city centre people could rehearse. Uh -huh. um, they kind of, it was in the days before health and safety existed, I think. Yeah. So there was like, um, there was a carrier bag cellar tape to the ceiling to catch the water just above an electric point, that kind of thing. Can wow. ask, that was their concession to it, really. I like that there's a there's a guy coming into the door in the in the rest of the sort of back of the room as, as, as if it's sort of almost tentatively, or, is, or am, I, am I ever reading that? It's, 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 it looks, it looks like slightly frightened from, from where I'm standing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> I'm also not sure much rehearsing went on there either. No, well, I mean, as you say, it's interesting because it, it's not quite. I mean, they're clearly not rehearsing, are they? They're just they're just standing. There. No, absolutely not. And but they do have their instruments out, so that's quite promising. That's right. I thought something might happen sooner or later. <laughs> yeah, there was always <laughs> that hope, you know. And also, I I kind of because at the time it, everything shot on film, obviously, so. I would always have to, um, I'd always maybe take two rolls of film and that was all I could afford. I'd have to buy my own film and pay for the process. Oh. So I couldn't really afford to waste anything. I'd always have to really be careful when, what I was shooting. Yeah. Um, and I just, I couldn't take lots of pictures to loosen them up or, or anything. 
I just have to make sure pretty much every frame counted, uh -huh. which was quite a lot of pressure, really. Sure. And did you have much time to do these things? I mean, was, you, was it straight in and out? I mean, obviously not. No, I, it depends on bands. Generally, when I was living in Manchester and doing this stuff, I, I was I was only a couple of years out of art school. So I just used to hang around with them anyway, even if I didn't have my camera. Oh. And um, then sometimes I'd take the camera and take some pictures of whoever was working there. Uh, but I, like I say, I you know I couldn't sh I didn't have the luxury of being able to afford to shoot ten rolls of film. Um, I wish I had maybe, or yeah. maybe not. Maybe having to be parsimonious with film helps enormously. Maybe it does. Yeah, maybe maybe it means you're editing it yourself kind of con unconsciously in a way. Well, you're editing in the camera all the time. Yeah, and, you know these days you can press the shutter and take pictures for the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. So perhaps someone, yeah. someone's got to edit them. Yeah. So the next the next image is is um it it struck me as really fascinating because it's eight, it's eighty one, isn't it, in press switch? Yeah. And around this sort of time there's a kind of bit of a trend for bands to be having pictures of themselves taken looking moody in a wood. And so I was quite mm -hmm. amused at this smart looking moody in the snow in press switch. I mean <clears throat> Uh, okay. Who else has been photographed in Woods? Echo and the Bonnie Man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it wasn't anything to do with that. It was because it was, across, <laughs> it was across the road from the pub where he wanted me to take the pictures. Uh, and I needed to get some decent outdoor shots. And the weather in Manchester over those few years had been quite brutal. So I thought it would kind of echo that a uh, sparse northern feel that I always wanted to try and get in the pictures. Um, similar, again, to the Georgia Mission shoot two years earlier. Uh -huh. um, and so that was kind of it. And he's not really dressed for the snow. I don't think he had a coat in those days. No, he doesn't look like he's dressed for the snow. As you say, he looks like, like he's just... No, and he's, got, he's got a drink in his hand as well. Yeah. And, it wasn't, and that's not a skinny latte, is it? I no, I don't think such a thing existed. But <laughs> probably, uh, it's probably got a scotch in it. <laughs> um, okay, and then so we move on. Oh, yeah, there's another one. There's another one of the the same shoot. Um, was this for a, was this for the enemy or just um, or someone somebody else? No, I think it was for Sounds. Actually, okay. um, they were they were really into the fall. The enemy. At the time, weren't that into it, and because I lived in Manchester, they didn't really mind if I shot for both uh, music papers. Okay. And occasionally, do the odd thing for Melody Maker as well. But I mainly work for the enemy. But like I said, occasionally I could do something for sounds if it wasn't a band they were going to cover that particular period. And did you find the, in the background actually? Yeah. Did you find Mark, Mark and the band were, were always hugely cooperative, or the other, the other, the, the reverse? Always what? Sorry. Were they always? Were they? Were they cooperative? Were they? Were they were, I mean, you clearly had you had football in common. So did you? Did you get on with them? Basically, is what I went. I always got on with him. Yeah. Um, you know, we he would. You know, we do he, bands. Our uh, bands. I I I've worked with a lot of them, and yeah. you know, I think so long as you've got something in common it's easy they're easy to work with yeah um and mark was quite challenging in the like i say he'd he'd always want to talk about man city or you know which gigs we've been to and stuff he'd do anything to delay taking the pictures yeah if you can imagine in january that you know you lose the light about four o'clock at the oh. you know, and especially when you're shooting on black and white film, you don't, and the pay, and, and the photographs are then going to be printed on the worst quality newsprint imaginable. Yeah. So there always had to be a lot of contrast in a picture to be able to make it work. Uh -huh. So I was always conscious of the time slipping away. And I think he was kind of doing his best to make it slip away. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, okay, and then let's move on now to the next, the next group, a couple of photographs, because this is, I mean, um, this is Mark collaborating 
on a, or with the ballet dancer I and mean, I am curious orange I mean what what was the story there well they they worked with Michael Clark on curious orange and it was very different for them and I think again Mark was the sort of person who he always liked to collaborate with people when it was maybe something quite unexpected um and it was you know to see those cultures clash was quite remarkable i think um and i had to go to edinburgh to do these that was um it was at the, it was um the i think it was at the edinburgh festival uh -huh. yeah. and then you know, we did all the photographs and then I had, they ran through the show for me so I could shoot a lot more. But we set up about five pictures that could be the main the main bulk of the feature. And at the end of it, he said, can we have those for our album sleeve? And I said to him, well, no, because they're for the NME for next week. And he, uh -huh. said, he said, well, you're not going to use them all. So... Uh, and I said to him, well, why don't you ask me to take some extra and we could have done something different for the album sleeve. And he said, because you would have wanted to charge us. Um, and he seemed to think that because it was for the NMA, I could just give him some of the pictures. For me. And in the end, the record company had bought, bought a few off me for the album sleeve. Uh -huh. But Mark's attitude was, they'd already been taken, so why should you get paid again? Yeah, I think I remember you, or you, I think you say in the book that you had a, you had some difficulty when you arrived in Edinburgh for actually finding them for this. Well, yeah, no one, and I was supposed to be met, and nobody, of course, met me. Right. And I ended up having to go into a bar. Um, I was going to just ring, again, there was no, we didn't have mobile phones. So I was going to have to ring from this, from this pub and um, try and get hold of my editor who could get hold of the record company. But I saw a leaflet for the show and so I found out where it was on and then uh, I got there. And he was kind of a bit disappointed that my sleuthing was so good and that I'd managed to find out where he was. It was another thing that he did regularly, actually. Oh, just to, just to keep you on your toes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the this trick was generally always go to the nearest pub to where he's supposed to meet you, and he'd usually be in there. Yeah, well, I think that's quite a good guiding principle. And then there's the, the, first, the first graph, the burger. Um, tell me, tell me about this one. Well, I don't know. But I mean, the, the set was um, the set was quite ludicrous, really. Um, and I don't know. I just kind of. The idea of Brex sitting on a burger in front of the House of Commons, I think you'd have to watch the video to understand any of it, really. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure. And they seem to, Michael Clark and um, Mark seem to get on. Is that, I mean, in the pictures, some of the pictures you've, you've got in the book late, later on, there seems to yeah, be a real fine. rapport with, between them. Yeah, I don't think he'd work with people he, well, I mean, he worked with quite a lot of people in the fall he didn't like. <laughs> if he's, if he's um, choosing to collaborate on something, it's because he admires their work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they got on really well. And this, the, um, on the burger photograph, this, uh, this, this kind of um, made me think about your cho your choices in this particular selection, because you selected the colour photograph, but the black and white, so there's, some, there's, a, there's a beautiful black and white of Greg sitting on this burger as well. I mean, um, what is your and there's some also some 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 sort of with with members of the crew pushing her around and stuff like that. Um, your choices of photo. I mean, you are you more you're, you're happier in black and white or you're happier in colour? Does it not matter? Uh, I don't mind really. I'm. <clears throat> I mean, I I learned. I studied black and white photographers mainly when I was studying photography and um, all music press printed in black and white. So there wasn't really an outlet for colour. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, mean, it didn't mean I couldn't work in colour. And it was always quite challenging to work in colour, I felt. Yeah. Because I would automatically think in black and white when I'm taking a shot. And so for me, it, it was a challenge. And I'd just done... I'd just worked on... A commission for Salford City Art Gallery uh -huh. the year before this, where I'd photographed 50 famous Salt Audience 
a lot of people who think we're from Manchester, but are actually from Salford. And to make it more of a challenge for me, because it's very, I used to find it very comfortable just working in 35 mil black and white, because I knew how to use the light in black and white. And I could, I could kind of work in black and white without pushing myself too much. And I, I shot everything for this exhibition, this commission on um, a Hasselblad in colour uh -huh. and made it all quite muted and quite uh, monochromatic really, but using colour. Um, so I was still in that frame of mind, I think, when I was doing this, in that I was so used to shooting by then on Hasselblad in colour that I took that into shooting music stuff like that for a while. Uh -huh. And you and the book includes, I mean, there's there's a there's a beautiful section of the of contact prints um in black again in black and white. I mean you've you have you have included numbers in numbers of points in the book as kind of almost like them. Uh, section breaks in that way. You've got these lovely these lovely sections of the of contact prints, which look, look extraordinary. I mean, and it just shows you how difficult it is actually to make the choice of the, of the, the right photograph. Yeah, I think, uh, and also as I as I said earlier, with having to shoot um, so sparsely, so parsimoniously, yeah. really, um, there's not much waste on the contact sheets. Um, and so it kind of shows the working from start to finish. And I know when I've looked at books of contact sheets, like particularly the Magnum one, uh -huh. where you can see how the you know you can see how the photographer works, and you can see you know they'll they'll approach a subject, they'll maybe take a shot from across the road. Then they'll get closer and closer and closer until finally they either get the shot or their subject runs away. Uh -huh. And I'm really interested in the mechanics of that. And I think it's almost, I used to be a bit hesitant about showing contact sheets, certainly early on. But I, I feel with time and distance, you, you, you can look at them and see something a bit different because photographers work in a very different way these days. Uh -huh. And they, you know, we didn't have that luxury of shooting digitally and just kind of taking 200 pictures of the same shot just to make sure we got the expression bang on. We had some people, quite a lot of people who, maybe people who never shot on film do say to me, well, how did you know you had the picture? And you knew because that was how you were trained, you know. I knew that I had a picture. I, you know, the only problem would then be if you took it to a lab and they processed it badly. Yeah. Sure. You know, we, used, we used to use this lab in, in the West End, Joe's basement on Wardour Street, who are no longer there, but they were 24 hour lab. Um, quite often after we'd shot a gig, you you know, you'd see various music press photographers sitting around there waiting for clip tests to come back and then adjusting the um, the exposure slightly and processing time. And um, when we've come to, to scan these in years later, they look like they were processed in tea with, with loose tea leaves. <laughs> There's so much crap on them. It's <laughs> And um, I guess, you know, they didn't have time to change the chemistry very often with being a 24-hour lab. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, some of the stuff that's stuck on our transparency, you know, it takes, takes days and days to retouch the, some of them. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Um, and then just to move, move us on, because I know you haven't got lots of time. Um, we've got to... Um, there's another the next the next image is from I think London '93, um, and that this one is beautifully composed with the with the fence and the tree and, and Mark smoking. I mean, not not a thing he was he was unused to doing, but I mean this is a what is the what, this this is part of a series of photographs in the book. Which, which what is it about this particular one that stands out for you? I just like the way he's. I mean, I've never smoked, and so I kind of not sure I understand the satisfaction behind it, but. He's getting every ounce of pleasure out of that one. 
and his cheeks are almost sinking and yeah. he's he's sucking on the cigarette so hard and he would also smoke in that very working class way of holding the tip between his between his two nails so he could smoke it right down as far as possible um and i kind of just like the fact that he's ignoring me and enjoying his cigarette halfway through the session mm -hmm. the only yeah. other person i've worked with who smokes as much in photographs is bowie uh, david bowie never seemed to not have a cigarette on and do you see many photographs of bowie with a cigarette there bowie with cigarettes yeah i've got loads of them have you <laughs> okay yeah. Um, I'm doing a Bowie book for next year, and I think oh, nice. uh, you know, I think it'll be an ad for Benson and Hedges more than a book. <laughs> cool. Um, and then moving on, um, you you come into the the two thousands, and you can see the the yeah we are snarly mark. But it, interesting this this um, because this is part of a shoot, it, it, part of which you're standing looking quite happy and, and relaxed with the band, but you've chosen this one. Is that because he was gradually getting more and more cantankerous, or or what was? No, he wasn't. I think because I'm not I'm not very assertive when I take photographs. I just let them. I let my subjects do what they want to do most yeah. of the time. Uh, I don't see. You know, I'm not the sort of photographer who tells them jokes or tells them what I was doing last night or you know tries to engage in some kind of form of banter with them uh -huh. I just stand there and then it's quite difficult I think it's kind of similar with some people's interview techniques they don't say anything uh -huh. so the subject feels they've got to fill the space and Mark would feel that and I'd be standing there with my camera on him and he'd be like well what are you doing and I just say, well, you know, just, just don't know, do, you know. Um, and he thinks he's got to do something, so he snarls into the camera a bit for me. Yeah. Um, and then laughs, you know. It's kind of, uh, I just sort of, I, li I like the fact that it's got some attitude. Yeah. And, you know, it was a, that was a record company shoot. And, of course, they didn't use that picture, but I used it in a previous book as well. Uh -huh. I think it now says quite a bit about him. Yeah, um, and clearly the, the the rock and roll lifestyle is beginning to take its toll at this point because I mean that fresh face yeah. of the cover is not here anymore, is it? Not a clean shirt though. Clean shirt, yeah, still still well dressed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so I mean the next one is also I think some context from that. Yeah, and that I guess it goes back to the point you were making about context about which is which is the right shot. I, I love the the one on the top right. If that's if you can see that one, that it's, the one with the lady walking past. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I wasn't quite sure about whether it worked, but I think it does. I think it's it's got quite a nice feel to it, and um, it was a way of maybe getting the two of them in a picture without them just looking like a couple. Yeah, and I just wanted something that maybe helped to frame him as well. Yeah. Um, and you can see in a couple of them, he's got his carrier bag that he thinks he's out of shot. He doesn't realise that I'm getting the hold. Getting his carrier bag. Yeah, so he's not, he's not bothered. He doesn't say to me, like a lot of people, he doesn't. He didn't say, um, you know, is it a medium close or how, what are you shooting? Where, you know, he, he, did, he wasn't bothered, really. Uh -huh. um, so he just stands there. No idea if I'm shooting in full length or not. Um, and his carrier bag to him is out of shot. Yeah, I like the idea of him not being bothered. I mean, um, it was that I probably makes better photographs for not being bothered in a way. I think so. I think sometimes when people are and people are very savvy these days about having their picture taken. Um, and I don't think a lot of people were even. 15 years ago, like the, you know, from when these were taken. I don't think they were particularly, some people obviously are, you know, models and so on, but, you know, he wasn't bothered, Mark. He would just, but to him, it, it was a matter of getting it done quickly and then going back in the pub. Yeah. Um, and then Which the next exactly thing. what happened in this session. Yeah. Um, 
the next photograph is is from I think Berlin. Yeah, um, and, and, and things. I mean, this is so actually this this is probably probably the only photograph like this in the book. Um, if I'm not wrong, I mean, um, and things seem as if they might be falling apart here. But I mean, is that is that accurate or not? No, not in the slightest. Um, for anyone who's been to see the fall a lot in concert, they'll understand that picture because. Yeah. What tends to happen at a fall gig is Mark's prowling around the stage. He's got a very long mic lead and he wraps it around everything. And then he gets somebody else's mic. And sometimes he'll get the mic out of the bass drum and sing in that. And then everything just gets tangled up. Uh -huh. This whole tangle of mic leads is very, very much what a fall gig was like halfway through. Yeah. And then somebody's got to get on there and sort it out for him because he is my his mic leads now about two foot long. But is this but this at this point the band were, I mean, is this quite close to the moment when he when he sacked people halfway through the tour and asked the, the support band to be? Yeah, it was. It was a few. It was a couple of months later. They were yeah. getting, they were they were all getting a bit sick of each other by then, I think, and. Um, they gone to America and they were plotting to just leave mid-tour and go home uh -huh. and thinking Mark wouldn't find out. But of course, Mark found out pretty quickly and sat in during the sound check, um, <laughs> had a fight with one of them and then asked if the support band who they'd got on that leg of the tour fancied being the fall for the rest of the tour. Uh -huh. And that was it, you know. And they made they made the mistake of thinking that they were indispensable. Uh -huh. But they should have uh, they should have read their rock history. I think <laughs> they should have talked to other members of the band. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the next the next couple of photographs, um, quite close to the to, to the point, you know, these these are quite close to being the last photographs you ever took of him, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, was he was he as ill as he seemed to be there, or was it was that was that just in play? He didn't look ill to me. I mean, he looked he looked a bit knackered in a way. Well, he quite often did, you know. He didn't yeah. look like he went on long walks through the countryside. Uh, you know, there's that's the pallor of a man who spends a lot of time indoors. Yeah, um, with a drink in his hand. Uh, you know, and I think it's, um, and again, you know, he was, an, he was an hour late. I couldn't find him in the local pub. I'd spent a bit of time, I found that wall as a background, which is actually quite a small wall on a car, in a car park near Salt Town Hall. And I'll, my worry again was that I was going to lose the light. And then finally he turned up and we did this, well, I think he's quite a remarkable set of pictures of him. No, I do too. Where he just sort of threw his head around and yeah. gurned into the camera for me. And I always, I think, you know, I've described them in the past, again, possibly because of the way the wall looks, that they look a bit like, almost like Francis Bacon paintings. Yeah, they do, exactly. Because his face is almost melting. Mm -hmm. And the next one too is 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 from the same. Yeah, I mean, even more bacon esque, isn't it? Yeah, and again, you know, it's just about to light a cigarette, and it's not bothered that I might not want that in shot. That's what he's going to give me. Yeah, yeah. And um, the final photograph um, is a is a sad a sad one, but it's interesting because the book the book kind of starts with Mark in a pub drinking. A, um, a pint of beer and it finishes I'm not sure if that's in a pub or where it is but it finishes with a pint of beer and his, his um, uh, the order of service from his funeral or his cremation yeah that's in the pub after the after the funeral yeah was there was there a playlist uh, there, there wasn't it was quite a, it was it was, it was um, quite a depressing affair to be honest um, yeah um, there was a fight. Um, there was. There wasn't a free bar. There was. Uh, there wasn't. 
wasn't like a record company do. Right. Um, it was so something what you'd expect, really. And quite a few people sitting around in a cold pub um, talking about Mark. And then we heard a lot of glasses smash and went outside to try and break the fight up. And then, um, and then there was just kind of people going home. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the celebration that he deserved. I don't think. No, but by the sounds of things, it was the sort of celebration he'd have been it, it, it almost almost appropriate for, for for how he was a fight, breaking glasses. Yeah, in a way, in, in a way, it was by you know, in a way, I I also feel that we could have had a bit more of a celebration, but yeah. that wasn't to be because there were certain elements there who didn't want it to be. Yeah, I mean, he certainly was, you know, great, great man. He should have, he should have had a better, <laughs> in my view, should have had a better, a better celebration of the end of his life. But hey, he probably would have, uh, he probably slapped me for saying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and at the beginning, you have an introduction by Simon Armitage, uh, who uh, writes very, very movingly about the band, but says uh, at one point, well, I actually like them. Uh, could the same be said of you? Do you like their music or was it just a gear for you? Simon. Yeah, no, well, he says that he says he actually likes them. And I wonder whether whether I could say the same about you. Oh, I love the fall. I mean, I've seen them, I probably saw them oh at least a hundred times. Yeah. Um infuriating at times, obviously, yeah. because they'd be only three hours late on stage if they could be. Um and you know, Mark once did a gig with his back to the audience because I was photographing them. And he just said, oh, I made your job hard tonight, didn't I, Cocker? <laughs> and I think, well, yeah, you did, but also, also I can just take a picture of your arse and the audience would actually quite like to see you. Um, so he, 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 four gigs, when you, they were never the same. You, you never saw two gigs in the, in the tour that were identical. Yeah. There was always something different. You could go and see them. They did this residency at this um, uh, cartoon club in Croydon once uh -huh. all nights. And every single night was hugely different. And, you know, sometimes obviously it depends on the mood of the band, but um, there was always um, a little bit of... Uh, um, tension on stage, I think, mm -hmm. is probably the polite way of putting it. Yeah. Well, on that note, we've, you, I promised we'd do this in 45 minutes. We've done it in 47, Kevin. I hope that's, that's not, great. Yeah, thank not you. intruded too much into your life. Anyway, well, thank you very much for that. Um, and um, I hope uh, you say the book has been well received, so I hope it's in, in lots of people's Christmas stockings. Well, let's hope so, yeah. I, I mean... You know, we did, uh, I, was, I was talking to people from Rough Trade and they were saying it had been selling really well and they were right. delighted with it. And they also said it's selling well in some of their shops where they don't sell many books around the country. So I think there's a lot of love for the four. And yeah. um, I would like to think, you know, my book makes quite a few people happy at Christmas. I'm sure it will. Anyway, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for taking this time so close to Christmas and uh, good luck with your, your Bowie book. I look forward to seeing it. Thanks very much. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye.